reasons I accepted to, to um, tell you to, to moderate this panel is that um, I happen to be French and I, uh, in my country there's, uh, as you all know, a, a major terrorist attack earlier this, this year and uh, uh, a short while later in Copenhagen another terrorist attack and I think that um, you're all aware of the, um, the this issue of radicalization, the question being, is the genie out of the bottle? Can we, can we put it back in the bottle? I don't know if that's the right way to frame the question, um, but certainly we know the uh, networks of foreign fighters are growing. Um, and one expert said to me recently, I, I heard one expert saying, the reason ISIS is recruiting so easily in Europe is that it is, the reason for its success is that it is successful in, in the Middle East. Peter said this, <laughs> so we'll hear more from him. So it's such a good quote. Um, I would like to. I don't. I don't want to present all the panelists. I think that. But I think you have the information in the booklets. Um, just to say that we have. We going to have a variety of views, both from Europe, from the Middle East. I think if we get something out of this session, it would be great to have from all of you um, an assessment. What is the, the key, the first key reason for radicalization? And what would be your first key formula to try to address it? The first uh, thing that you would um, uh, uh, see as the most important um, in addressing this, this problem. I want to present somebody, uh, Charles Ford, who is not on the, uh, in the booklets, as, as in, in, in any case, the one I have. And, um, Charles, you are um, Director of Security and Counterterrorism at the Home Office, and you have uh, a distinguished career in the field of uh, counterterrorism and in diplomacy as well. I wanted to ask you the following question, and each panelist has prepared a few minutes as, as an opening uh, statement, but to, to, to launch you, I, I wanted to ask you, we've heard recently from uh, the relatives of uh, the Bradford women who have left for Syria with their, with their children and from their lawyers that one of the reasons for their radicalization was behavior of um, police forces, security services. Is this in any way whatsoever related to religion to its claim and something that needs to be looked into? Um, thank you. Are these microphones working from here? Yeah. Um, Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this, which I really welcome. It's a very interesting gathering, of course. So the Prime Minister, so I, I will uh, defer to him on this matter, uh, talked a little bit about some of the excuses which have been made, uh, of course, last week in his speech in Bratislava, and uh, I, you know, said perfectly clearly, I think, that um, the claims which have been made by that family or by their lawyers and, of course, previously by others around rather similar events uh, were at, at best incomplete. And personally, I've seen absolutely no evidence of any kind whatsoever that the activities of the police were a critical factor or indeed any factor in the radicalization of those three people and in leading them to travel to um, Syria. I think there were lots of other factors which we could talk about. Um, at least in general terms, but you know, police action uh, is not one of them. What would you say about the two points I tried to raise? Uh, I think it, yes, <clears throat> they're good questions, and like any civil servant, I, I want to answer them in, in, uh, uh, in exactly the way you've asked them, because uh, in all seriousness, if there was a single factor in the radicalization process, let alone a single solution to it, I think we would have found it by now, and uh, we would all be working on it across Europe and further afield. And the difficulty we face, one of them, is that of course there is no single cause and there is no single solution. I mean, if very, very briefly, uh, I try to capture a huge amount of respect in this country and further afield into specifically issues around Islamist radicalization, I, I don't know whether they apply in other contexts. We think of three key factors. Uh, one back around the other influence and the third need, which I think is quite a good way, or as good a way as any of conceptualizing this problem. It's certainly true that some people's background in this country, though not a predictive factor, 
does seem to be uh, more than normally important in encouraging radicalisation. Uh, a background of broken families, lack of integration into what one might call the mainstream of the society, uh, some level of criminality, sometimes um, uh, family conflict, are all more than normally apparent. Uh, I could go on, but background is relevant. Influence, of course, we don't need to be reminded, is a key factor for us. Influence, in particular, of, as the Prime Minister was saying last week, uh, extremist organisations in this country and in other countries who normalise a view of the world which is conducive to terrorism. It may not explicitly call for violence. These groups are clever and uh, stay within the law. But it can create circumstances in which violence can be presented relatively logically as the only solution to a particular set of problems. The third issue, need, is not to be overlooked. People join uh, terrorist organisations in this country and in others because they get something out of them beyond merely satisfa satisfaction of an ideological imperative. And sometimes it is about uh, resolution of personal problems. Sometimes it is about certainty in an environment which has deprived them of that. And sometimes it is about excitement and esteem. And we should not overlook the last two factors in particular. They may be mundane, apparently, but they are clearly very, very relevant. And they're perhaps, Peter can talk about this, more relevant in the Syria-Iraq context than in many other contexts that we've worked on over the past five or ten years. So, I'm sorry, there isn't one. Uh, on the solutions, you have to map solutions to your analysis of causes. And so, clearly, you need to put in place, as we have tried to do here, French government has tried to do in France, many others have tried to do across Europe. Components of a solution across all those factors, so a counter ideological component, a component that deals with uh, psychological need and tries to address that in other ways. I would add to that a component with groups of people's health. There is a very disproportionate influence of mental health issues in the radicalization process. I could go on, <coughs> suffice to say, there isn't a single cause, there isn't a single solution, there is a multiple set of causes I think it's pretty clear in this country and others, and I think we're trying to work our way through a rather broad-based solution to some of those challenges. Thank you very much. Bilhan, I'm going to, to turn to, to you. Uh, um, for you, you work on uh, dialogue between European countries, experts and Israeli ones, and um, just recently, uh, Europol, the um, European um, Police Cooperation Organization, announced that it will be launching an operation on social media in Europe to counter Twitter feeds and any you know, tweets that, that uh, of course, spread radicalization. So this has been a fairly big announcement. Is this the right way to go from, what, from your perspective? Is this, does this make sense? I hope I'll give you an answer for my structured presentation. <laughs> um, I, I have very quickly four uh, methodological steps, and I'm concluding with four guiding principles that I think should, should guide us in defining uh, Israel. Louder. So, I Can you speak in the microphone? Yes. Thanks. I, I began with, uh, with the, the dilemma that we all have. The dilemma that we all have as researchers when, we, when we're trying to, to research a subject now, and, uh, and we have two options, either Google or Facebook. You go to Google if you, if you believe in the machines, and you go to Facebook if you still have a shred of belief in, in humans. So I went to both, uh, and I collected some very interesting insights, including, for example, the definition of radicalism, which for some people in the room may be obvious, for some not. But I think the interesting part of it is radicalism, obviously, is a relative term, it's relative to the center. And perhaps we're not talking enough about the center. What constitutes the center? How does the center move in various contexts, both in the Middle East and in Europe, by the way, also in Israel? Uh, what are the reasons for that? And how does then, as a, almost as a derivative of that, does uh, the spectrum of radicalism change? So, radicalism obviously are actions and ideas that are substantially deviating from the center. And actually it was created in the 19th century here in Britain uh, as, uh, as uh, within the liberal camp. 
some radical factions were created and they, they were named for the first time radicals. So they were radical liberals. Another interesting way of looking at the term radicalism is to ask what is the opposite of radicalism? Is it conformity? Is it mainstreamism? What is it exactly? Uh, it's not moderation. Um, and then I come to your earlier point of why do people become radicalized, and of course especially Muslims. And uh, I caught an interesting research that was made recently based on interviews with <coughs> all the recruits of ISIS. Some of them, by the way, dead by now. Um, and they identified, first and foremost, and this is the, the answer to your, my answer to your question, what is the key driver for radicalism, identity. It's all about, or mostly about identity, by the way, both for quote-unquote foreign fighters, Westerners, they differentiate between Westerners, between external Arabs who are migrating to conflict areas uh, to take part in, in, in the action, and for internal Arabs who are homegrown within those areas of conflict. So the common denominator is identity, and then you have all sorts of interesting also variations. Those who are thrill seekers, they call them, those who are status and revenge seekers, mostly who have been again homegrown in those conflict areas. So I, what I think the first step we should do as, as a strategist is to delineate the problem and to focus on what it is that, that uh, we actually need to fashion a response to. What is the strategic goal? How, how, do, we, how do we define it? And, uh, and I think, and it was mentioned by, uh, by uh, the rabbi who just left, that uh, within theological studies, we know that radicalism and the center are constantly fighting. So it's not as if we can define the ultimate goal as completely erad eradicating radicalism. It's not going to happen. It's not realistic, as we said before. And uh, I also concur with what Ambassador Tal was saying about humility. We need to be cautious in the way we, uh, we define the goal. So I think it's not about eradication, it's about mitigation and containment. Um, what are the threats that we need to contain and mitigate? Obviously, security threats, and it was mentioned briefly, and they, they, there's a wide spectrum there. Political threats. Economic threats, ideological threats, and it was mentioned by the Rebbe again. I think the ideological side is extremely important. Um, so, what are the potential responses? I, I think the first thing I would look at is do we have success stories? Um, and I think Tunisia is an interesting case in point. This is a country where uh, it was proven that Islamists can actually win elections, but they can actually lose elections and stay within the system which is an extremely, I think, an extremely uh, important precedent. It didn't happen anywhere else yet. <clears throat> As Israelis, we should ask ourselves honestly what are the lessons that we can draw from our own experiences, both in Gaza and the West Bank, but also with an interesting case, which was mentioned to me on this Facebook uh, discussion that I opened by, by a defense prof an Israeli defense professional. Let's look at Israeli Arabs. What are the lessons that we can learn from the fact that within the Arab Israeli community, radicalism, I don't want to say it's non existent, but certainly in relative terms and also in absolute terms, is certainly not prevailing. What is the reason for that? Um, and that's, that's an interesting case study. So, in conclusion, I have four principles for response to this very obviously complex problem. Number one, differentiation. We need to be very careful in the way we differentiate between those radical, violent terrorists, ISIS is the obvious case in point, and other radicals who are who may be on the fringes of the mainstream, who may have very extreme views, but are non-violent. I think this is the first line that we need to draw very clearly when, when looking into a response. Case in point there is obviously the Muslim Brotherhood. <coughs> I just mentioned that we have within the Israeli parliament a Muslim Brotherhood faction. I'm going to read it. Okay. Um, number two, reward. Reward those cases, those models, those factions 
that are playing within the scope of the system as we would like it to, to be, and I also already mentioned Tunisia. Number three, rethink. You need to constantly be rethinking your premises and uh, the principles by which you operate, including, and this I know is a very big point, the very rationale of the Arab nation state, the post sykes picot Middle East, and what does it mean in terms of fashioning a region which is less radicalized. And the fourth one is obviously collaboration and cooperation. And here I would mention non-Western forces. I think China, and even Russia to a certain extent, can and should be harnessed into this system of, of responses. That's it. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Um, it's enough. I'm going to turn to the others. Um, I don't know if you had some, maybe some slides. Some okay, you've okay. given up on the yeah, slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would you frame the question from your perspective? You've, you've watched the phenomenon of radicalization among uh, Palestinian uh, communities. Does it make any sense to compare that with the radicalization we see among uh, Europe's Muslims? Are we talking about two different worlds here? Well, the, um, you know, let me give the introduction and then at the end I'll, uh, I'll get to that because uh, I think there is a certain overlap and there's some things that are very different. Um, when people talk about uh, Palestinian uh, radical, uh, radical Islam and Palestinian Islam, they usually think of Hamas. And in fact, it's true, Hamas has adopted and its principles uh, includes the radical Islamic principles. What we're watching and is concerning us tremendously uh, in recent years <coughs> is that, <coughs> that the Palestinian Authority and Fatah, Palestinian Fatah are moving in that direction as well. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples of this to show how this has been shifting. Um, last October, November, we had a mini terror campaign around Jerusalem. Uh, mostly it was cars that were running over civilians, people were being knifed. Uh, it ended with the uh, horrific murder of four rabbis uh, in a synagogue during prayer. Uh, and this had a lot of exposure around the world, a lot of international condemnation. Well, the day after this happened, the, an advisor to Mahmoud Abbas, Sultan Abu al He's also a member of the Fatah Sending Committee. He posted on his Facebook, one of those slides that you're not going to see, he posted a picture of two of the dead rabbis in their prayer shawls. He put a picture of a tremendous pool of blood on the floor of the synagogue. And then he wrote as following, pictures from the scene of the heroic operation at the Religious Zionist Institute. Now, the next day, the next day he added to that, Blessed be your quality weapons, the wheels of your cars, your actions, and kiss your knives. And this is a key. Because they are according to Allah's will, we are the soldiers of Allah. And that sounds like Hamas, but this is a fatah plea. This is Mahmoud Abbas's advisor. Killing civilians, rabbis in prayer, is part of Allah's demand, and that makes them the soldiers of Allah. Now, it wasn't just the individual. The very next day, the, the fatah parliamentary faction itself issued a statement, and that included the following. Uh, the faction welcomes the martyrdom seeking operation in Jerusalem, and we escort the martyrs to paradise. Now, the word for martyr is shaheed. Martyrdom seeking operation is ishta shaheed, which means they're actually at the highest level. They wanted to be martyrs. Uh, they sought martyrdom. So we have Fatah saying that going into the synagogue, murdering rabbis, being killed in the action, is bringing these people to the highest level of paradise. And this is fine. And that's the critical, the critical issue here. Now, the, 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 uh, this categorization of everyone who murders civilians and is killed in the act as a shahid has been Palestinian authority policy for a number of years. For a number of years. Um, and where is this coming from? And this is critical also. There's a hadith, a hadith is Islamic tradition attributed to Muhammad. But this hadith goes as follows. The hour of resurrection will come until Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. The final Jews are going to be hiding behind rocks and trees, and they're going to give them away and say, Muslim servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Now, this hadith, which calls for the genocide of Jews as condition for resurrection, appears in the Hamas jar. In fact, Hamas introduces it with the words, uh, Hamas is looking forward to implement Allah's promise, however long it may take. Now, why is this significant? Two years ago, the Mufti of the Palestinian Authority, Muhammad Hussein, at a Fatah anniversary celebration, quoted that hadith, 
calling for genocide of Jews, and they said, this has been Fatah's battle since the beginning of Fatah until today, until the end. So Fatah is adopting the Hamas ideology that genocide of Jews is a Muslim destiny. And like I say, this is happening in the Palestinian for Now, what makes it worse is we're not just hearing it at the leadership and the religious leaders level, we're hearing this hatred being passed on to children. And I'll give you an example from just three weeks ago on official Palestinian television. Uh, we had a young, beautiful little girl who's the second slide you're not seeing. Uh, and she recited a poem, and the poem included the following words. You murdered Allah's pious prophets. And this is a reference to Islamic tradition that the Jews are condemned for murdering the prophets. <coughs> Sons of Zion, the most evil amongst creation, barbaric monkeys. And the barbaric monkeys is a reference to three references in the Quran that talks about uh, Muhammad turning people into the monkeys and pigs. So, Palestinian TV has a young girl talking about Jews as barbaric monkeys, the most evil of creations, and this is the third time we're hearing this program. Uh, we're hearing this poem by children of Palestinian TV. And there are many, many other examples. One poem, which we've heard 10 times, includes the words, uh, Zion, or my enemy is Zion, Satan with a tail. All of this, and this is 10 times by children on Palestinian TV uh, in recent in recent years. Now, all of this is focusing on attacks on Jews as Jews. I'll just mention one example. It's not just Jews and Jews that has been radicalized in the PA. Attacks on Israel's legitimacy, the ability to accept Israel as a neighbor, has also been attacked in, in Islamic terms. Recently, both the Mufti, I mentioned Muhammad Hussein, as well as uh, Muhammad uh, Mahmoud Abbas's uh, personal advisor in religion, um, uh, Mahmoud al Abash, both in recent months said all of Palestine all of Israel, which means all of Israel land, is waqf, holy Islamic land, and you cannot leave it in the hands of the occupation, meaning all of Israel has to be destroyed. Now what's significant here is two principles of Hamas, the two most dangerous principles, the two greatest impediments of peace. You can't recognize Israel's right to exist in the name of Islam. You can't recognize Jews' right to exist. Both of those have been preached by the leaders of Fatah in recent, in recent years. Now, the final thing I'll just point out about this is the irony of all this, or the great tragedy of all of this, is speaking here in the UK, is that while this kind of hatred is condemned around the world by the United States, by the UK, by the EU, it's the UK, the EU, and the United States who are funding this by funding the Palestinian Authority. 30% of the Palestinian Authority budget comes from Western New owners. Uh, this could not continue, and, and, and every time, I'm, and, and I've spoken numerous times here to members of parliament who've been outraged and they've gone to parliament floor and they, they brought this up, and if it always has some kind of excuse or justification uh, to explain this, uh, and that's the great tragedy, is that with 30% of the budget in Western hands, they could condition that funding on the end of this agent. And it's our hope that, that UK, United States, EU will make that demand in the Palestinian Authority, and that will be the first step toward a more peaceful future for us, our children, and for Palestinian children as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to talk to you now. Uh, you work for the Kelman Foundation, which uh, fights radicalization among Europe and the UK and the Muslim communities. Um, what are your answers to those two questions? The main reason for radicalization and today, the situation we're at, uh, the main step that it should, be, should be taken to address this. Thank you. Thank you for the invite uh, to come and speak at this very, very important event. Um, I'm going to start my presentation, first of all, to echo what Charles said earlier on. And I'm really pleased that he, the Prime Minister, and our Home Secretary have been using the word Islamism. Uh, President Obama made a very, very good speech a few months ago when he said that there was an evil ideology at play. And what he forgot to do was to actually identify what that ideology was. Which means that if he doesn't do it, if our leaders don't do it, then other people start doing it. And this creates polarization, and this gives suckers to the far right, gives suckers to the far left to support Islamists, and, and people in the field uh, are under the victim mentality uh, program, if you like, as I call it. Um, and it is vital and important but I also want to say, there is a difference between Islam and Islamism. Just as there's a difference between social and socialism. Social is the way that we all interact. Socialism being a distinct political ideology, which is left of centre. Islam is a religion practiced by just under 2 billion people around the world. A faith that I choose to practice. 
um, um, and we all practice it differently. Islamism is a distinct political ideology that wants to do two things. Actually, three things. First of all, set up a utopian Islamist caliphate and enforce their version of Sharia law on the people in that caliphate, as we see now in the so-called Islamic State. Secondly, to actually spread that state around the world so that the whole state is covered by the flag of that particular um, uh, it's the organization or that particular state. And thirdly, to wipe Israel off the map. So there is a clear difference between the faith and the political ideology, and it's very, very important that we actually do define it. I want to talk about, when we talk about radicalization and Islamist radicalization and what do we do and how do we combat it, for me, I, I've, I've been in this field now for about 11 years, just, uh, just after, well actually just before 7-7. Um, for me, there are two clear parts of a fight back, if you like, to try and put the gene back in the bottle, as it were. There's the sharp end, the hard end, which is once somebody who's been identified as showing support for Islamist extremists, for violent extremists, for Salafi jihadists, or whatever you want to call it, sympathy or support, then needs to be an intervention. And this intervention is being carried out right now, the Home Office is doing, actually doing quite a good job in that area, because one of the ways that we actually measure whether the sharp end is actually being successful, because it uh, focuses primarily on the UK, is the number of inverted from a successful jihadist attempts we've had in the UK. Since 7-7, we've, we've had only one, and that was the killing of Drummond and Rigby. The other end, which is the softer end, is how do we build resilience within the community? How do we make sure that when <coughs> young, or sometimes not so young people, are actually, um, have these narratives actually indoctrinated upon them, they've got the ability to push back. And that's not just the government's responsibility, that's all of our responsibility. That's civil society's responsibility. And I want to talk about that particular area a little bit more today. Um, if we move on to some of the pathways, it, it, excuse me for some of the repetition, but I think there are, in sort of from my anecdotal experience, there are three key parts to the pathways as well. The middle part, which is the lens, which is the intellectual, the ideological, social, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the narratives and the conditions, which will take people who are in the first part who may have either a genuine grievance, a perceived grievance, or a partial grievance, and force them onto some solutions. What's a genuine grievance? Well, a genuine grievance could be, in the case of some people who have been radicalized the son of jihadism, that they don't want to marry their, girl, uh, their uh, uh, cousin in Pakistan, they want to marry the girl from the university. And this drives them to look for solutions, drives them to the hands of charismatic recruiters. A partial grievance is a grievance which is based on the truth. Foreign policy, Israel Palestine, anti Semitism, which seems to be the opium of Islamist radicalization. I still am waiting for somebody to convince me that foreign policy or, 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 or the Zionist and in inverted commas Israel state that these Islamists will blame for all of their troubles. I still want to find out, I still want somebody to explain to me how that actually justifies the, the raping of Yazidi women in Iraq and Syria and the killing of other Muslims. I still don't get it. Yeah. The third, third part is perceived grievances. And in perceived grievances, an example is a person that I've worked with in the past who used to be a recruiter for a senior Islamist organization was once on a train and he saw a woman who happened to wear a hijab and he identified her as a Muslim through the hijab. She had a young child with her and there was a newspaper she was reading and it was a story on pedophilia. He very quickly identified that this woman must be uh, worried and concerned about the protection of her child and she's got pedophilia on her brain right now so he built up a narrative to say that the Western society is so corrupt, it's so immoral, they'll never accept you as a true citizen, you'll never get support and protection for your child. Come and join the first part of the four solutions that I'm, I'm, I want to talk about and that is join the global Muslim woman gang, as I refer to it. Set up a utopian in this caliphate. Struggle towards it. It's the only way you're going to belong. It's the only way you're going to get any support. The second solution is the theological justification. I'm a Muslim. I don't believe in, I don't actually interpret the hadiths about uh, the rock uh, and the Jews hiding behind the rock in the same way uh, that Islamists and Hamas do. We can talk about them a bit later on if we want to. Um, but these guys will say, 
Once they've got them to actually believe in the utopian school's caliphate, the only way they can be a Muslim is to believe in it. The only way they can be a proper Muslim is to discard all of the Muslims. And guess what? God wants you to do it, and God will reward you for doing it. The third solution is revenge. We are seeing now, in 14 years of the war on terror, more and more people, a bit like Northern Ireland, who know somebody who ascribes to this global Muslim movement, who have relatives or people in the tribe who have been affected by the war on terror. And the fourth one, as Charles mentioned rightly, mental health issues, solutions to mental health issues. A country that I've worked with in Europe has identified that over 40% of the convicted Islamist terrorists in prison suffer from Asperger's syndrome. One of the killers of Drummond Lee Rigby was actually being treated for clinical depression. And if you look at the recruitment videos that I still have, they are actually focusing on uh, um, jihadism, coming to the land of jihad as a cure for depression. So these are the three key areas we need to work in. The first one being social cohesion, the final one being the hard end of prevent, and the third one being the ideological challenges. Finally, uh, we must also forget, we mustn't forget that one of my uh, fellow colleagues talked about, a uh, panelist talked about nonviolent <coughs> extremists. What's the difference between somebody who happens to believe that all Jews should be killed because they're Jewish. They have to believe that anybody who changes their faith in an idealist and this kind of faith to go through due process of Sharia should be stoned to death. What is the difference between somebody who believes that all people who commit adultery should be stoned to death and ISIL? The only difference is one is doing it, the other one isn't. They couldn't, they could if they did. They would do it if they could as well. And perhaps we should think about that. Uh, and from a Muslim perspective, I just want to quote Imam Mali. Uh, who was the fourth caliph and the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he actually said that we are all brothers and sisters in faith, and if not, we're all partners in humanity. And that's the approach that I take, and that's the approach that the many of the Muslims that I know within the UK and around the world who are taking on the challenge against Islamist radicalization believe in. Thank you. Quoting him and not naming him, um, Peter Newman, who uh, is from King's College and has a uh, long experience also of studying this, ph this uh, phenomenon of radicalization. Peter, how, how important is it to distinguish the uh, ideas from the acts that can come out of these ideas? Are we fighting an ideology? Do we need to fight an ideology overall? Or we do, need, do we need to focus on the acts that can be committed and, just, and the people who are? Uh, uh, able were uh, decided to commit these acts. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Peter Newman. I'm a professor at King's College London. I'm also director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, which is a research center at King's. And we started that center because we believed that there was a real need for good rigorous academic empirical research to really understand what we're talking about. And to answer your question straight away, of course it is important to fight the ideology because ultimately it provides the rationale for people um, doing bad things. What I want to focus on is the threat that we're facing in this country and that we're facing across Europe right now. I believe the threat is so severe, it is probably more severe than at any point in the last 10 or 15 years because it is coming not from one, but from three directions. The first one is always being talked about. That's the so-called foreign fighters. Jihadists who are going to Syria and Iraq who want to join mostly ISIS. And of course, when we're speaking about this phenomenon, we have to acknowledge that it is the largest mobilization of foreign fighters that has taken place in the Muslim world since 1945. We're always talking about the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s as the source and origin of Al Qaeda, for example. If you look at the figures, the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s mobilized up to 20,000 people. Now, it is estimated by the UN, amongst others, that already in only three years, 25,000 people have gone to Syria and to Iran. And that's over the course of just three years as opposed to an entire decade in the case of Afghanistan. What's also important is that whilst the majority of these 25,000 people are still from Middle Eastern countries, 
up to 20%, up to 5,000 people, are actually from Western Europe. And if you look at some Western European countries, you can see how significant the degree of mobilization is. Britain is, if you want, in the middle field. It is not the worst affected country, but it is uh, not the least affected country either. The worst affected country in Europe in terms of foreign fighters is actually Belgium which a population of just 11 million, but 450 people who have gone to see in Iraq. That's a larger number than the combined total of people who have gone to any conflict before in the case of that particular country. And you can find similar numbers in Scandinavian countries, in France, and to a lesser extent, as I said, also in Britain and Germany. So there is a very, very significant degree of mobilization going on. But that's not the end of it, because there is a second direction of the threat that is often forgotten, which is enthusiastic supporters of the Islamic State who have not gone to Syria. If you look at nearly all of the attacks that have taken place since September, whether you look at Sydney, Ottawa, the attacks on Christmas markets in France, the attack on the kosher supermarket in Paris, Copenhagen, none of them had actually become foreign fighters. None of them were so-called returnees. All of them had at some point played with the idea of going to Syria and Iraq, but for one reason or another, they couldn't go where they didn't go. They were simply enthusiastic supporters of the Islamic State who had decided rather than going to Syria and Iraq, they would rather do something here. And I think that's as important, imminently as important a threat as returning foreign fighters from Syria and Iraq. In fact, if you look at the pattern of how people go to Syria and Iraq, you see that often it is very similar. You have clusters of people, one or two go to Syria and Iraq, and successively they bring over their friends. But often, the people who are in Syria and Iraq are connected to larger clusters of people, often dozens of people, who have not gone and who may choose as an alternative option rather than going to Syria and Iraq, for example, to attack the Jewish institution in Europe, which the Islamic State has given them permission to do. So that's a very, very significant threat. The third one is, of course, if you want, the remnants of Al-Qaeda. It is often forgotten that Al-Qaeda still exists, they still have supporters, and as we found out in the case of Charlie Hebdo, they feel very much under pressure to show that they still exist and that the Islamic State is not the only game in town. So if anything, I would foresee some degree of competition between the networks of both of these groups, which is bad news for people here in Europe because that competition will be suffered, for example, by Jewish institutions in Europe. And so that, in my view, is the accumulation of different threats that we're seeing right now it comes not from one, but from three directions. And the challenge is twofold. And with that, I'll end. The challenge is twofold. Firstly, the challenge, what we need to understand is that this is going to be a generational problem. People, journalists in particular, are getting a little bit impatient. They're saying, oh, we haven't seen any attacks from returnees yet, so maybe it wasn't really a threat after all. The truth is, if you take the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s as the analogy, 9-11, the attacks on America 11 September 2001 can be traced back to Afghanistan in the 1980s and the people and the networks that were facilitated there. However, the attack happened 10 years after the Afghanistan conflict had ended. My prediction is that what happens right now in Syria and Iraq will have consequences not in 2015, but even in 2020 to 2025, because what we're seeing there is the creation or recreation of an entire new network that will be with us for many years to come. And the second challenge or problem is, of course, one of volume. I don't know if Charles agrees with me, but wherever I go in Europe and I speak to security services, and some of them are pretty good. They really have caught up over the past few years. And what they are telling me is that they're driving in fifth gear for a year or two. It is not necessarily that they would struggle to understand the problem. 
the struggle is to cope with the number of cases that they have on their desks. And even very, very sophisticated organizations like MI5, for example, in this country or other organizations in other countries are saying that at this rate, at some point, someone will slip through because security services always have to prioritize. They cannot watch every single one of their suspects 24-7. They constantly have to decide who do we think is really dangerous, who is less dangerous at this point in time. That sort of trade-off becomes more and more difficult the more cases you have to deal with. And the danger is, of course, that as this trade-off becomes more difficult, the chances of someone slipping through the net, through the net is becoming is becoming greater. And so that that challenge of volume and that challenge of this threat being with us likely for a very long time, I think the two key challenges for the years to come. I would like to, um, I'm going to ask just one or two short questions to the panelists, but uh, do uh, think up some questions. I'd like to open the discussion to the room. You have a great um, uh, lineup here of experts, and there are certainly some aspects of the question that you would like them to, to address that maybe have not been addressed, but some things that worry you. Um, I, I, I wanted to go back to you, Charles, um, about actually what, what Peter just said, which is, are we actually in a situation where the numbers are so big, uh, 20,000 foreign fighters in, uh, in Syria, right? all over, it, all over, from all over the world, but big, big uh, rivers, let's say, of them coming out of Europe, and, and we don't seem to be winning this particular um, battle of statistics, we don't seem to be able to uh, narrow down um, this flow of young Europeans to the Middle East. Um, is it a question of resources, or is it a question of strategy? So I, I would be cautious uh, about almost anything to do with numbers in Iraq and Syria, um, because being responsible for the production of them, I can assure you that different European states count numbers in different ways, and we are not comparing like with like. Uh, the overall headlines are, as Peter has set it out, there are broadly 20,000 foreign fighters operating uh, in Syria and Iraq, as you rightly say, much greater than the number in Afghanistan, which was the greatest number we'd seen. Of those, it's probably about 4,000 are from Europe. Uh, note, I said operating in Syria and Iraq, not part of ISIL. These are two different numbers. In the early phase of the conflict in Syria and Iraq, many people from this country, and most of those who have traveled from this country, went in an attempt to participate in what they felt to be was a moderate opposition to Assad. Um, as it turned out, there was very little moderate opposition at the beginning of the conflict, and there is almost none now. And many of the people who went initially actually have come back and posed no immediate threat to us, no immediate threat to you, and no immediate threat to many other European countries. So numbers are tricksy. Uh, just drill that a bit into ours. So about 720 people have traveled from this country, people we know have had an extremist background to Syria and Iraq since 2011 as well. About 350 of those have come back leaving about 300 or so, uh, a bit more than that there. Of that 350 still there, a proportion, not clear to us it's even a majority, are with ISIL in all sorts of different respects. So numbers, you know, it's complicated, I'd be cautious. The headlines are quite interesting. Let's just go back to the other part of your question. Not everyone who has fought in Syria or Iraq particularly not the group that went in 2012, 2013, are a threat to anyone outside Syria or Iraq. They went there, probably in an entirely mistaken view that they could topple the Assad government. <laughs> and uh, we argued with it at the time. I remember talking to many Muslim communities in this country saying, Al-Qaeda is operating in Syria. You will get talked up because of Al-Qaeda. Please don't go. It's not as simple as you think. People went, I think we were right. Uh, many people then came back when they discovered it was not as simple. 
Um, and the people who, as I say, uh, then went, the second phase, went not because they thought they were fighting Assad, but because they wanted to join a terrorist organization. So the first phase, we were not so worried about. Uh, it's not so worried about. The second phase is much more troubling. The second phase are traveling because of terrorism, not in spite of it. They're going there because they are joining a terrorist organization, not because they necessarily are remotely interested in a sad people. And I think that subgroup is our problem. Uh, and you are right that even when we, when we hone it down to a, a, a subgroup of the 700, um, the numbers are very challenging for us and very challenging for other European security services, many of whom, I think it's fair to say, in Belgium classically, have had far less experience of us uh, than us of these problems. Can I just, uh, just quickly conclude though with one other comment? I'm a little bit worried about this genie and the bottle stuff. Um, there are 2.7 million Muslims living in this country, uh, probably more. Um, 700 at one time or another have been in Syria or Iraq in, and have caused us concern. 350 <coughs> is still there. 350 of 2.7 million. Of those, a smaller proportion, as I've said, are actually with ISIL. Uh, it's probably in three figures, but not necessarily much more than that. So I think we should be really cautious. Uh, I think the genie is still in the bottle. Uh, that does not mean to say that the challenges we face are not significant. They definitely are, but they don't get easier if we overstate them. And the more we overstate them, the more, frankly, we risk labeling Muslim communities as somehow intrinsically extremist, which actually, actually, despite an unprecedented wealth of social media of propaganda by ISIL, they have proved not to be. So I think we need to be cautious with our metaphors and with our numbers. It's all a bit more complicated than they first appear. Uh, so before I go to you, I'm going to let Peter make one small comment. No, I, uh, I just wanted to add uh, to what Charles said, because uh, he's exactly right. Our and other European countries' ability to cope with this problem will be determined by how good countries are in terms of distinguishing between what we call the three Ds. The people who come back who are disillusioned, who no longer believe that the fight they were asked to fight, that the fight they came there to fight, who can be reintegrated into society. But there are also two other groups, um, the, what I call the disturbed, who may not necessarily still be ideologically motivated, but who have been traumatized by the conflict and who may pose a risk to society regardless. And then, of course, the third group, the dangerous, and our ability to distinguish between these groups will be important in terms of deciding whether institutions are able to cope with numbers. Because if you are able to pick out the right people to look at, then of course the numbers will become a lot smaller. The other point though is, I believe it is legitimate, we'll be happy to hear that Charles, I, I think it is legitimate for security services and institutions to responsibly grow because the threat is where it is. But I think at the same time, we need to make sure not only to sort of adjust the size of institutions to the size of the problem, but also to make sure that fewer people are going in the first place so that Charles has fewer yeah. cases to deal with. And that means a, a, a concerted investment into de-radicalization programs, intervention programs, prevention programs, where Britain to some extent is leading, but other countries in Europe still have a lot to catch up. Is the, is the genie still in the bottle? In fact, and please raise your hand if you have any questions for all the youth here. One here, one here, one here. Is there another? I see four. Yes, okay. We'll try to fit in four or five questions in a row. Yeah, just very quickly. I, I think it's unfair <coughs> to put all of the expectations to fix the problem that we have uh, on the government or on. Uh, on Charles's department or others, because one of the things is we can't legislate our way out of this mess. We can't look at this mess purely through the eyes of legislation and criminality. Um, so when we say, are we losing the struggle or are we losing the battle? Um, I think we need to ask the society, and, and, and not just Charles and, and the government. I think every camera now, Prime Minister, last week was absolutely correct. There are some, not, he did say all, 
some Muslims that do condone the ideology. And I think that where we are losing the battle as a society, where we're playing catch up on what we need to do are three key areas. First of all, we're losing the battle online. We're, and we're playing catch up. An individual doesn't go online to buy a handbag or a pair of shoes and then they become a jihadist. They have to be looking for something or someone has to find them. We are losing the battle and we need more digital natives, youngsters, to actually wear an exercise to take that battle to them. The other area I think we really need to focus on is education and the schools and get to our kids and get to everybody when they're younger. There is a CTS bill that was passed, counter-terrorism and security bill that was passed in February that was made a statutory from July for schools to actually keep an eye open for radicalization. Some schools actually have called tattoos and don't actually know what they're going to do about this yet, but it, they will have to do something. And I think that more investment has to be made into going into schools and actually helping assist these teachers to help make Islamism just as unpopular and just as unfashionable as racism or fascism. And these are the key areas, I think, that and we're doing a program this week where we've got a group of 15, 16 year olds a whole year who are making videos about this very, very thing. And then through a process of critical inquiry, they will actually analyze what they've actually done. And I think more investment needs to be made because it is a generational battle. And we mustn't forget and just focus on the people who have come to join ISIL or are coming back because they are a small percentage of the people who may be sympathizing or empathizing and youngsters who may be indo being indoctrinated online uh, through digital natives. If you agree, I'd like to hear the questions from the room and then, maybe, and then I'll, I'll come to you and you can pick one of the questions if you like and we'll take it from there. So please, one, one question here. I don't know if there's a microphone. Please, the lady in the blue shirt. Is there a microphone? Yes. <laughs> Very early this morning, and many of us know uh, that there are many Muslims who are really sick of all this, yes. But there was a, a speaker from the Muslim community his name I couldn't catch. It's the first time that I've heard somebody speaking so vehemently against this type of action, yes, that was taken. And I think whoever he was, I'll play that. One has to have more of him and more of others, as Cameron has said, yes? My question is too long because the next question is to Mr. Park. If we are going to have any system, and he was saying this morning, <coughs> there should be education in schools, then it's going to cost money. Are we prepared to spend the money? Or are we going to declare that we haven't got the money? Okay, thank you. Um, please, a question here. Yeah, my, name, my name is Jonathan Paris. I'm a Middle East analyst. Are we asking the right question? I think the question of the future of Iran and Charles is the potential subversion of Saudi Arabia. And if Saudi Arabia goes toward Daesh, we're going to have a bigger problem of British Muslim radicalization than we have now. Let's focus on the, on the real question, the real problem. Also in the front of the queue. Uh, my question is, much has been said here about uh, the people who go to ISIS and maybe Al-Qaeda. But we know that there is some report about the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and their role in this. What is your opinion about their role in radicalization? Yes, uh, Ruth Bevan, I teach at Yeshiva University in New York City. And my, my point is, uh, last September I was in Australia. Uh, at the time, there was jihadist activity there in Sydney and in Melbourne. And the Australian mass media were filled with the idea that ISIS represents the fascism of the 21st century and that it would take a century to deal with it. My question to you, is this a useful model? If it is, then it's a model where we would know that anti-Semitism is a tool, not an objective. And it becomes an entirely different paradigm with which to work. Please introduce yourself as well. Jacob Turner, I'm the international lawyer. There was some disagreement between Itamar and Haras 
with regards to the interpretation of a particular hadith, a, uh, a teaching within uh, the Islamic fiqh, its jurisprudence. To what extent can radicalization be solved by an interpretation of the jurisprudence of Islam which rejects terrorism and its tactics? Or is this phenomenon something which can only be solved by dealing with the social problems which were mentioned by other speakers? Or is it both? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take one last question. It's short. Hello, Ben Wellington from the Telegraph. A quick one for Charles, if I may. Social media is part of this whole conversation. Um, how would you characterize the likes of Facebook, Twitter, other US social media sites? How would you characterize how they have helped the British security services and would you like to see them do more? Okay, that's a good array of questions. What we're going to do is I'm going to give each panelist few minutes for a bulletproof, a bullet point answer, <laughs> bulletproof and bullet point answer uh, to, to the question that he would prefer to address because I don't think we're but um, I'll start with you, Tamar, and I'll go to you. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a different uh, disagreement uh, between me uh, and the other panelists about the interpretation of the Hadith. What I was telling you was the uh, Palestinian Authority and Hamas interpretation. And this is critical. And one of the great uh, problems we're seeing, and also actually as the key to the solution, is that the Palestinian Authority is using Islam, and that was the question, is there anti-Semitism, or are they using it as a tool? The Palestinian Authority is using Islam for its own purposes, and even distorting in Islam. And I want to give you uh, two interesting examples of this from even one of the sources I mentioned. First of all, there's a, a verse in the Quran that talks about the children uh, that uh, Muhammad, uh, the, the Quran promises that the children of Israel will return to the land in one gathering. Now, there are many Muslim leaders uh, that interpret this as the, the Quran prophesizing that the Jews are going to actually return to the land of Israel. Sheikh Balaji of Italy talks this way. And in fact, in our office, uh, we went and we checked the Middle Ages with the original sources, Tabari and other sources. This was always interpreted as Islam recognizing the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel. Now, what did the Hamas do with this and then subsequently Fatah as well? Hamas, there was a sermon earlier this year, and the Hamas religious leader on television said, we have to fight the Jews, we have to kill the Jews. As we know, Allah has promised in his book, and then he said, I will bring them forth in one gathering so you can kill them. Without a pause, as if that was the quote. So he interpreted this, the Jews would be brought to Israel, so it would be easier to track them down to kill them. And then Abbas Zaki, who was a senior Palestinian Authority Fatah official, said the same thing. So what we have here is the Palestinian Authority using Islam for its aim. I'll give one more quick example. I mentioned before, there are three references in the Quran to um, turning people into uh, monkeys and pigs. In one of the cases, they were violating the Sabbath, so it was the Jews are monkeys and pigs. Two ways to interpret that in Islam. There's one interpretation, those individuals violated some law and they were punished and that was the end of it. There's no implications for Jews in the future. But there's another interpretation that all of the Jews today are descendants of those monkeys and things. The Palestinian Authority and Hamas have chosen the more radical interpretation, which is not necessary. They could have taken the simple interpretation. That problem of the PA and Fatah is also the solution. We need to support the moderate interpretations of Islam because the radicalization is all based on the sources and the twisting of sources. That's what the solution is as well. Thank you. Yeah, what is the question I'm sure, I'm sure. you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly. Four points. Number one, I just don't want to create the impression that I agree with it, what Itamar is saying on the Palestinian issue. I have a very different view. And I think you're committing the mistake of not differentiating between radicals and non radicals. There are differences between Hamas and Fatah. They are important. It's a very big story which I won't go into. On ideology. Um, I do believe that there is a mission of constructing a non-violent, non-extremist, pragmatic, maybe even moderate interpretation of Islam. This is not a, mesh, a mission for external forces, this is a mission for Muslims, and I'm very happy that we have one right here. But this is still obviously a, a pretty rare occasion to be able to hear a Muslim speak uh, like uh, my colleague here. On Saudi, I absolutely agree. And we focus very much on Europe and not so much on the Middle East. The core of the problem lies in the Middle East, not in Europe. And the solutions must also address.
interesting the least, and we some of missed that because we were kind of Eurocentric here. And lastly, for Kuba, I think the Muslim Brotherhood, whether we like it or not, are <coughs> the mainstream of many societies, many Muslim societies, including Egypt, including the Palestinian Authority. They won the elections, they might win them again. So whether we like it or not, whether we want to call them radicals or mainstream, we need to deal with them in a different way compared to the way we deal with ISIS. Would you like to yeah, some very, very, very quick points. First of all, Muslim brother, we missed a very important uh, fatwa in the 1990s, late 1990s. That was the global Salafi Jihad that was issued by Osama bin Laden. We've also missed another very important fatwa that was earlier on this year, where the Muslim brother declared a jihad, a combative jihad in Egypt. We will see the consequences of that uh, later on. So uh, they have the same beliefs, they will get their. Uh, they had violence in the past and they will have violence again. Uh, the other thing is around uh, jurisprudence. Uh, absolutely, and as a university has recognized over 400 different types of legitimate uh, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, one of my colleagues recently did a report a few months ago called uh, From Dimity to Democracy. He didn't do anything new. He, all, he, all he did was, there was some original analysis, uh, but some previous fatwas, and we need a resurgence of this traditional classical uh, type of interpretation. And the final thing is that, um, ISIL, no, not just call, but if we just focus on ISIL, if we just focus on Daesh, we've got a problem. We'll have a problem much, much later on. Let's focus on the ideology, let's focus on the whole aspect. The non-violent extremists want the same things <coughs> as the violent ones. So as a society, we need to counter them in the same way. Fascism, the same way we counter fascism. Absolutely, we have models, because fascism is totalitarian, do it for the state, Islamism is totalitarian, and all they're saying is their version, do for God. George, would you like to address the question of how do you possibly tackle a long term effort which is just to be And you can see the situation or the resource problem again. That as well as all the other questions. <laughs> so, I, sorry, I'm just going, I'm, I'm going to stick to the questions. Um, I just want to comment on the online, first of all. I don't agree with Harris that we're losing the online uh, struggle. I think ISIL is the, the terrorist organization in our history which has, of course, made, made the most use of the online space. Uh, it, it's logical that they should do so. Their tactics, their strategy depends on the online space. I think we have had um, good collaboration from the major social media providers, Facebook, Google, Twitter in particular, but not only on removing ISIL propaganda where we have flagged it to them and sometimes where we haven't had to. Um, about a thousand items a week are being removed uh, by the unit that we fund support, which is part of our uh, overall operation. We're about, as the Prime Minister said last week, to create a European unit based in Europol, which will broadly be doing the same, handling referrals, which will go through the unit into social media providers from other European countries. Yes, ISIL have done a very good social media effort. We've got a very good method of uh, operation and reply. We're also supporting many, many community organisations in this country with their own online counter narrative, counter propaganda. Uh, and some of those don't avow our support, and we're very happy for them not to do so. Second point, I completely agree with Jonathan. I don't actually think it's just Saudi Arabia. It's the Saudi Arabia is one. I think Tunisia. Uh, previously referred to is a real challenge. Uh, there's a very many thousands of fighters have left from Tunisia, and history suggests that many of them will go back. So destabilization of other states in the Middle East is a very fundamental challenge by foreign fighters, and the numbers of 16,000 are from those states. They're not from Europe. So, uh, and the capacity of some of those other countries, including Tunisia to deal with returning foreign fighters is, is uh, for discussion, let's just say. Uh, uh, on the um, other points, the Muslim Brotherhood is of course a, um, a key issue in this country. Uh, and all I would say about that is that the Muslim Brotherhood in this country has, as elsewhere, incubated and supported what is in this country a prescribed in part terrorist organization, namely Hamas. Um, and has not, and never has, challenged some of Hamas's terrorist methods. And it's very hard to imagine that they can therefore claim to be particularly strong opponents of what we have come to know of radicalization and of the use of terrorism 
for political purposes. You could say a great deal more, uh, but I would say that, um, finally, if I may, I think the person from the back, Islamist jurisprudence, uh, not of course the job of government, is very important in clarifying certain concepts and terminology. But it is undoubtedly the case that a revision of Islamist jurisprudence, if that's what is required, will never be sufficient to deal with the threat of radicalization. Because many of the people we are dealing with know virtually nothing about Islam, but in a paradoxical way aren't that interested in Islam either. We should be really cautious in assuming that everyone who goes off to fight for ISIL is, is a fanatical Islamist in any meaningful sense of that term. Uh, so it's important, but it's not the whole story. Sorry. Thank you so much. We have one last uh, uh, minute from, yeah. from Peter. Uh, I just wanted to, to add on that, which is, so we've, at my center, we've created a database with the social media profiles of 700 of these Western foreign fighters. We've had conversations and interviews with over 100 of them. So we know this population really well. And what you see is that, of course, People want to do the right thing. In that sense, theology plays a role. But it's equally important to recognize what Charles said at the beginning. A lot of them went over because of that sense of excitement, adventure, empowerment, and being part of a winning team. I could give you dozens of examples. Let's stick with one. Jean-Edouard, a 20-year-old guy from, from the suburbs of Paris who had been basically a loser all his life and who knew and who realized he would never make it in French society. And then he looks at these pictures of his friends who've gone over to Syria, who are heroes, who are important in society, who are carrying weapons, who seem to have a great time. And for him, he went over not necessarily because he knew very much about Islam or because he had studied that theology for many, many years, but he was excited about the prospect of going there. And I think that needs to be addressed. The ideology needs to be addressed too, but perhaps also in different ways in the sense that all the fatwas against ISIS already exist. The theology is there. The problem is that you do not have people who are liked, charismatic, and credible in communicating it. Anjan Chavri is not a great scholar of Islam. Omar Bakri or Abu Hamza were not great scholars of Islam, but they were liked by the people who followed them. They were respected for their scholarship, not because they were great scholars, but they were also able to facilitate personal bonds. This is my last sentence. This is my real yeah. complaint uh, with Muslim communities in Europe. Not that they are radicalizing people, but, but that they haven't been able to produce charismatic, credible people who are able to communicate a more moderate message. If you are a 17-year-old European who is conflicted about his identity, who has perhaps come from a broken home, who has dabbled in criminality, all these questions on your mind, you go into your local mosque, what do you find? You find old men who don't want to talk about these issues, who have no understanding of what a 17-year-old young Muslim goes through in England or in France. And that is, that is a real thing because the next step is that they're going on the internet and they do find Salafists who do address these issues and have all the answers. Thank you for the good questions. Please, please join me in thanking the great